Spirit of God, we pray that you move in and through these ancient words, that they might become your living word, and that, having heard it, we might become your living witnesses. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For God was our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we are reading from Luke's Gospel, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I printed it off, so I am actually taking it from the Bible, but I'm just reading it right off the pages here for purposes of reading it. So we invite you to listen to what the Spirit may be speaking through the Word in Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner, evil. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to the place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone raises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. This is one of those hard passages that we Presbyterians sometimes get really uncomfortable because Jesus is talking about hell, death, and punishment. And we're not real comfortable with it. And at least on the surface, that's exactly what's happening. But it's way deeper than that. It is way deeper than that. But this week, as I sat down to write the sermon and as I planned on talking about what does it mean when Jesus is talking about payback after life and after death, things change once again. Terrence Crutcher and Keith Scott both killed this week when they encountered police. We've been here too often. We've come to this place here to talk about these things one too many times. In fact, more than one. And so when I sat in my office on Thursday and I began to type, when I wrote with these words, I asked for your indulgence. What the hell is going on? What, we don't know enough? 
People want to tell us to wait to find out until everything has come in. And then finally, if this had been all white men being killed like this, it might just be a national tragedy. But it's not. Because of fear. Because of fear of black people, fear of black men. Fear and gun. Fear and the power of the law behind it. Isn't that what most of those officers have said? I was afraid of that unarmed, scary black man. Not quite what they said. I think something like the Incredible Hulk. Oh, that was another shooting. Is it possible that these killings were not based in fear? I doubt it. And we have a problem that we all know exists. We're all tired of it. And we're all sick of it. I hope. And then we encounter this passage. How on earth is he going to make this connection? Let's see. The rich man. It's odd because we don't know the rich man's name. That's strange. Their culture, like ours, worship rich folks. We always know their name. Warren Buffett, Steve Jobs, Oprah Winfrey, J.K. Rowling. Can you name some others? Of course you can. But in this story from Jesus, it's just some rich guy. Which lets us know from the very beginning, this is all very odd. And can't be taken simply at face value. Because if it is, I don't know about you, but I don't have anybody sitting on my front porch starving with sores on their body, so I'm good, I'm in. That's the problem with the surface reading. The other problem with the surface reading is like, ah, if you're suffering, don't worry about it, because oh, you got heaven. So we don't have to change your life circumstances. That's the problem with the surface reading. But oddly, what we do get in this story is the name of the person whose society has ignored and kicked to the curb, literally. His name was Lazarus. This man didn't even get the leftovers. But we have his name. Now, I know this is a story. Jesus is telling a parable. But Jesus gives his name. The homeless who get removed whenever we get a little uncomfortable. But we know this person's name is Lazarus. Jesus gives a name to a man who is not even acknowledged by the rich man who walks by him every single day. Having a name means a lot. And it means you aren't just the help. Jesus is trying to get the people who hear this story to be uncomfortable and to be unhappy because he's just accused the leaders of the church, the faithful folk, of being lovers of money. And here's part of the problem, right? The rich man actually knows the name of that man who's dying at his gate. We don't find that out until later in the story. But he knows his name was Lazarus. And it's only when he needs something from him that he bothers to acknowledge his humanity, sort of. Notice he doesn't ask Lazarus. Says Abraham, send that poor schlub that used to live by my house to take care of me. Or if you're not going to send him to me, send him to my brothers too. Oddly, he was there day in and day out. That didn't seem to work. But here's the thing that we have to keep in mind in hearing this story. When Lazarus, or when Abraham says no, there's a great chasm that has been fixed between you and us. That's the crux. Here's what I mean. In the natural order that God has created, there is no separation from neighbor. In the great order that God has created, God expects that we will all be in relationship with one another and Him, and there will be no chasm. So the question is, 
This chasm has been fixed. How did it get there? Well, the good theological question is, or answer is, sin. Yes. But what it tells us is that the chasm that existed then, that exists in the world, in the time of Lazarus and today, are chasms that we've created. Human beings created the chasm that separates Lazarus from Abraham in life as well as in death. And in life and in death, he cannot cross the chasm, the rich man, of his prejudice, of his arrogance, of his ignorance that the chasm that he's living on was created. In some way, I fear that he believes that chasm is fixed for all time, like the natural order of things. But it is not a natural chasm. It is a chasm that exists because we allow it to exist in our minds and our hearts. God did not create this chasm because God desires that all will be one. It's us who choose to separate. The suffering rich man might complain to my words. I didn't make that chasm. It wasn't me. It's just the way the world is. It's the world we inherited. There's nothing we can do about it. So I'm going to worry about me and mine. Can you go help my brothers? Not can you go back and tell all the people who believe like I do that we actually should listen to what the Bible says if we're going to use it and call ourselves Christian. There is something we can do about the chasms that have been fixed. But the truth is, in every generation, God raises up people to dismantle the chasms that existed in the world. Jesus hints at what's coming in this story. They won't even believe if somebody comes back from the dead. Y'all got that he was talking about himself, right? He was alluding to the fact that at some point that God's love says no to the death. Ultimately, we love death and violence. That is who we are as human beings. Jesus came to share God's love, and our response to God's love was to kill him in the most horrific way we possibly could. It reminds us that despite our polishing ourselves up, we can be pretty horrible human beings. But God has not left us on our own. And in every generation, Jesus reminds us in this passage that we have all we need already to work on the chasms around us. We have everything we need from Moses and the prophets. And Jesus coming back from the grave to show us that the chasms that exist are not part of God's created order. They have been created by us. And because these chasms are created by us, the good news is, they can be dismantled by us. Let me give you some examples. The examples I'm going to share, I'm going to use the language of we. And if you're uncomfortable with that, that's okay, because on some days, we're really comfortable with the we as American people, citizens or non-citizens of the United States. And other days, we're not so comfortable with it. So we have to own it all. Like our family history, that we only want to tell the good stuff, we really have to own the rest of it too. We are the ones that created the chasm, the institution of slavery, and the highly detailed rules and laws and machinery that created America. Written right into the Constitution, by the way. And we are the ones who dismantled it through a bloody war. So we get to claim both of those, and we can't ignore either one. It is we who created and upheld the Jim Crow laws. And it is we who turned a blind eye to vigilante justice. But it is also we who ended it. A few weeks, and then it grew. You know, it's also we who created a housing policy along with the GI Bill and a banking policy that made sure that wealth would not flow into the black community. 
We created that very complex system, and it worked really well. And it is one that is slowly, even now, needing to be dismantled, but we have a long way to go. It is we who created a system of schools that were based on property value to ensure that rich kids got a head start. And that hasn't changed much, but we have the ability. We have the ability, and people are chipping away at that chasm, but we've got a lot to overcome. So when Jesus says these chasms are fixed, this is what he's talking about, because that's what led Lazarus to suffer at the door while this man gorged himself over a lifetime. It is we who created a system of policing and prisons that target black and brown men. And this too needs to be dismantled. But it takes someone. It takes a whole lot of someones to realize enough is enough. And to find other people who have also said, enough is enough, let's get us work together to overcome the chasms that are around us. But the truth is, sometimes just acknowledging the chasm is a human creation, is enough to cause all sorts of anger. You might not know this, but in the United States, football is one of our national religions. I, I don't know if you knew that or not. I played for eight years, I love the sport, I'm distracted by it too. So I'm coming at this not as someone heaving stones at something I don't know what I'm talking about. But it provides many people the opportunity to ignore their troubles. Your day-to-day -day troubles if your football team wins. Now, you think this is crazy, but did you know in the state of Wisconsin, on the Sundays when, on the, seriously, on Monday, the Packers lose. That's the team in Green Bay, for those that are really bored and going, please stop talking about sports. But this is why it's important. On Monday, the rates of domestic violence reports go up. I'll let that sink in. Now, it's a very simple, if you've ever been, and this Sunday last year, I was sitting in Cleveland, Ohio, participating in this ritual. And of course, the second thing, and cheering for my team. It's steeped in patriotism and militarism, and I'm someone who regularly has participated in this. And it's why I believe that when one young man was sick and tired of being sick and tired, he knew he could draw our attention in the midst of our national distraction. When Colin Kaepernick decided to not stand up or then to take a knee and continued to do so, he believed that he could do something to be part of a solution to a mess. He didn't know how to dismantle, but he had to do something. He knew, like others before him, that the chasms in our lives are not God's created order. They are not fixed eternally. And if he didn't do something, who would? And people are angry because he just pointed out what we're busy trying to ignore with our national distractions. He wanted to point out that Lazarus was at the gate. Throughout the life of the rich man, Lazarus was at the gate. The rich man had Moses and the prophets. He knew the stories of his faith. He knew. He knew that God expects us to overcome the chasms in our hearts and in our world. He knew. And his response was to do nothing. Maybe he become sick. Maybe he decided, well, that's just the way the world is. Or maybe he spent every day sumptuously feasting 
to numb himself from the fact is that he didn't want to do anything about it. But here's the powerful thing. Even in death, he could not imagine another way. I've heard it said, and I, I can't give credit. I wish I could, but just something that came to me while I was thinking. That in some ways, folks have imagined that heaven really is the same place, but for some, it will be a living hell. You can take that for what you want. Even in his death, this man saw Lazarus as nothing more than an extension of his own personal needs. But our trouble is actually far greater than Lazarus's. Maybe we're in a little bit better condition, I don't know. You see, for years, we have actually made sure that Lazarus isn't anywhere near our gates. We've placed people in prison. We've pushed them to places in the city we don't go. And we've starved public services in those neighborhoods. And now, we have the increase of videos and the internet and all this stuff that we have been comfortably been able to ignore if we wanted to, we can't ignore it anymore. And that's infuriating for some folks. I mean, people have taken to the streets and interrupted our leisure opportunities. I mean, come on, it's immunity. Why, why would you bother us on this night? But what I believe in the midst of this, is that it's a continual reminder that there are chasms around us that we don't want to talk about or think there's nothing we can do about. What's being revealed, I believe, is that we are hearing voices of Moses, the voices of prophets, and in the Bible, and the prophets of our own age. Now, before you say yes, but that person has flaws, then you don't know the prophets very well. They were all deeply flawed human beings. But their message was true. I think part of it is, is trying to figure out how do we follow the example to Jesus on how do we undo the chasms of our time because if you're anything like me, looking at them can feel like there is more than we can ever do and we feel paralyzed. Or maybe that's just me. But I know it's not because I've heard from folks, right? What we need to do, I believe, is to look around for the people who are already working and have been for generations, sometimes, and sometimes they're new. But they are already working to overcome and to change the chasms of our time, figure out how to join with them. We're not all called to do it the same. My guess is, if you don't get up during the national anthem next time you go to a baseball or a football game, yeah, no one's going to notice. So that's probably not your call. We need to look for our opportunity, though, to take a knee when folks have ignored Lazarus just one too many times. We need to look for opportunities to give a witness that the troubles of our time are not created by God. And sometimes, just acknowledging that can be something that starts moving us. We can make a change. But if we're thinking that we have to do something huge and grand and something that gets everyone's attention. Remember, and I think it was this week, that John Lewis said it was the women who drove the early days of the civil rights movement. <coughs> they were the organizers. They were the ones that kept us on track. But we don't always know their names. Of course, it's always that way. I heard that from the choir or something along those lines. We can't have change. We can't have these kinds of things without people who are willing to use whatever gifts and talents that God has given you to be part of dismantling whatever peace that you find yourself connected with. 
in the chasms of our time. It was true in Jesus' day. Very few of the women that were bankrolling his whole ministry got named. However, they made a huge difference. And I believe that each one of us in this room, no matter your age, your understanding of the troubles and the chasms, you can make a difference. That's our call.